Um, so thank you so much for joining us in our candidate interview series. It's so nice to meet you. Um, we're just going to start off by having you introduce yourself, what position or district you're running for, and if you have any past involvement in politics at all. Awesome. I'm Nicole Wall. I am running for Ventura County Community College District for Area 3, which includes a number of cities. I won't list for time purposes, but a number of cities from Camarillo to Santa Paula to Fillmore. We kind of jet around and I am a school teacher in Thousand Oaks as well. Well, that's wonderful. Um, so I just want to ask what drove you to actually run for this position? Were there any particular issues in mind that, that you thought you wanted to address firsthand? Um, so I just want to know what your thought process was when considering running. Yeah, well, it came after years of conversation with a couple friends one in particular who's a professor at Moore Park College, and we were discussing the inequities we see in the communities that we teach. And we kept going back and forth on things and realizing that it was systemic, really systemic, that um, my English learners, the dis discrimination they experienced and the barriers that were put in front of them continued all the way through. And um, it, outraged me in some in some major ways and because of that the professors union who my friend's a member of uh, approached me and said hey we need someone we need somebody that is outraged about some of these inequities and or all of these inequities right and someone who understands what it means to be in the classroom to see this happening to see the possibilities and the solutions from an insider's perspective and um, I checked with them and said, are you sure? I'm a school teacher. We say what we mean and we mean what we say. And I'm not a politician. This is my, this would be my first run. Are you sure you want to bank on me? And they really, they heard what I had to say about um, my beliefs on transparency and accountability and social justice and especially equitable access. And they backed me and we are moving forward together and I'm hoping to win in November. <laughs> Well, that's amazing to be a grassroots candidate in this particular election. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I actually wanted to ask, um, because you touched on um, how you saw firsthand the inequities that students were facing. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes. So currently, I'll, I'll talk about what's going on with pandemic right now. 2020, when we're in that classroom, virtually, I'm teaching at home with my own children, and they are privilege. We are the sitting on a mountain of privilege. And I have students that are moved here last year, middle of the year, right before the pandemic broke out. And there, there's a language barrier, there's a communication barrier, there's an access barrier, just getting internet, just to even get to the curriculum is inequitable. So if they live in the same apartment building, so they have more than one family in there or more than three students online at once, they can't get to the programs. Whereas my own children who have a lot of privilege, they can get on, they can get on because they're not in, trying to have five people come through or things like that. And it's just not, it's not fair. It's not right. It's wrong. Um, and we weren't prepared for it. And, the, and I, at the community college level, it's magnified. I have former students dropping out. They're giving up on their dreams right now because they cannot work to support their families, work to pay for internet so that they can get through just to access the curriculum right now. It's inequitable across the board. There's quite a lot. And I think from um, a teacher's perspective, I'm seeing it day in and day out this child is being kicked out of a Zoom. Well, that's gonna be happening at every level because that child also has college age siblings. I know because I taught them and they're getting kicked out of these things too. So how are we fighting these systemic problems if we're not changing it at every possible level, starting in the K-12 and continuing it through community college, which is really, what got me, I had all these students do so well through the K-12 situation and they get up to the community college and they face barriers like no, like people of privilege do not and it's infuriating and unfair. So got lots of plans. <laughs> 
hopefully I'll have a chance to put them in place. Um, actually, I want to touch on that as well. Um, uh, what are what exactly are your action steps to foster that inclusive community at the community college level, or just like in the district that you're in as well? I love it. Well, I'm a restorative justice facilitator, which I'm told not everybody understands what that is. So I've been trained. I've um, spent many hours being trained for um, restoring justice in the classroom and implementing a program. And in fact, I implemented the first tier of a restorative justice program in the school that I teach. And I'm um, collaborating with Restorative Justice Resources Foundation, um, which is local and trains many, many teachers. In fact, they train whole districts, right? And we're still in collaboration trying to work on how we can bring restoration into the educational system by having these conversations saying, listen, there's this pile of privilege. There's all these inequities. How do we balance this? How do we make sure that education is accessible to everybody? And what it's coming down to is coming into it is with an open mind, asking questions like what happened? What can we do to repair what we've done? Um, and having these collaborative conversations, which right now at the, in the board that I'm applying or trying to win, there are two warriors on the board right now, board trustees that are just fighting for this so hard to have these conversations and they're getting voted down, voted down, voted down. So when and if I get nominated into it, we can actually start moving that needle, talking about social justice, talking about why are only certain children, certain young adults, certain people having access to education, pandemic, no pandemic. Why is this discrepancy there? What can we do within our power as a community and as educational leaders to fix it? And I'm ready to have those conversations. I'm ready to research, I'm ready to listen. And I've already been collaborating with a couple organizations um, outside of it that um, are really truly moving the needle and we're hopeful that we'll get to continue moving it come November. Uh, that's amazing to hear that so much <laughs> change is already in the works. Um, <laughs> Uh, what I also wanted to ask is, um, do you believe that it is the board's responsibility to understand these issues that students are facing or just to be not just to be able to touch base with everybody and not have to have students report these issues themselves? It's their responsibility to be aware of these things. I think it's your responsibility as a decent human and a community member. I mean, it's just being completely transparent. You cannot ignore them now. and. As an educator, even if I tried, it wouldn't work. I wouldn't be, you'd be blinded. You can't ignore them, whether you're a community member, whether you're on the board or not. But when you're put into that leadership position where your sole job is to help with the decisions to make sure these don't, these inequities don't continue to grow and to level it, you need to have that conversation. You need to feel uncomfortable. You need to feel like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Oh, my or fragility or whatever so that we can move past it and respect the plight that those who are really struggling are struggling and not just say oh well, it's not really happening and ignore it we can't you can't and as a board member there's so much power that they can do and change and once when and god willing i'm that third vote we can really make some huge changes and make sure that people are being heard and not just swept aside for whatever political gains and things that are happening. That was so wonderfully, beautifully <laughs> stated. It's true. It's true too. It's not, you know, I, as I say before, I'm not a politician. I'm a teacher. So I can't, this is not an area where I'm going to make big promises or um, say something I'm not comfortable with backing up or doing. Yeah, completely. Um, and also, I wanted to touch on just as your background as a teacher, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge that needs to be addressed right now? If, if you were elected, the first thing that you would want to address? Oh my gosh. There's so many, but really, really, truly is seeing that students are supported and that they can get the education so that they're not feeling like, okay, I have to give up this dream because it's between 
feeding my, helping to feed my family or feed, feeding my family. Cause for example, I have a student, I'm allowed to speak about her. She gave me permission, <laughs> former student. She's a mom raising three kids. She's married and working full time and she's in her early twenties. That's a lot. And that is a huge population of our students. So I don't think there's been enough conversation about how are we supporting our students? How are we using our teachers, which are valuable, incredible resource, who are the eyes and ears of our community? How are we utilizing them? What voice, voice are we giving the teachers, the professors, to communicate like, listen, hey, board, we're seeing this. We used to have classes of 40 students always coming in. They can't now because it's remote access. Some of them don't have access, all of that. I don't think that that communication is being clearly um, conversed. And I, because I'm a teacher and I'm nosy, teachers are nosy. I think that I will be just naturally curious to get in there and find out what is it that our students actually need that to access education and to give a quick little analogy of it. Um, years ago, there was this philosophy for English learners. I um, helped with the master plan for Canadian Valley Unified School District's uh, English learner plan. And they've done a beautiful job. I'm very biased on that, but they've done a great job with their English learners. But years before that, before we had the leadership that we have, there was this philosophy that if you just gave English learners a device, so we just give them an iPad, the one to one, and everybody will learn, it'll be great. It doesn't work. And it was made by people who, that those type of decisions were made by people that aren't in the classroom, aren't seeing that, okay, now they're having to learn a third language, which is the language of the iPad, along with English, and the uh, unspoken language of friendship and communication those kind of choices happen over and over all the way from kindergarten all the way into higher education so if you don't have that inside view you're going to be giving kid uh, students ipads thinking it's going to sell save everything just throwing a bunch of money at them that's not practical because you didn't ask the students hey what did you need oh well actually i just need someone to sit with me and work with me or asking college students, what you need well i just need a place where i have an internet connection that doesn't drop, right? It just, some of the most common sense decisions because of communication, I think, are what's going to need to happen moving forward. Uh, definitely, especially for communities of color um, that may have a uh, a language barrier in terms of technology, because if you're not, if you're not used to using technology this often, it's something that you only use right. when you're at school or in the computer lab or like in the school in the college library. And now suddenly mm -hmm. switching to having to do all of this stuff at home. If the school just even if the school is providing you a computer, uh, you know, simple things like using Google Hangouts or Zoom are not things that people are used to using every single day. Right. So I, I definitely agree with your point on that. There's some digital literacy in it, but there's also the um, cultural irrelevancy, like people that are assuming that students can just turn on their cameras and be a part of it. Well, okay, if you're in a single family home with room to spare, okay, but what if you have a multifamily home? That's not practical. And it's ignorant for those that are creating these curriculums or creating programs to think that everybody has a quiet space to work no matter how old you are, and has steady in internet, it's just very um, not culturally responsive, right? You're not taking into factor the other cultures and how they can be applied. Sorry, it's my son. <laughs> um, and, I, and I'm hopeful that just even having this conversation that people will start to go, oh, I didn't even think about that. You know, or like, oh, yeah, I didn't even think like, my neighbor has a different life set up than I do. And I was only thinking about what my experience is. Do you understand what I mean? So I think yes. that there's a lot to learn from each other and thinking about, okay, more than one culture or more than one dominant privileged culture. 
Um, actually, um, so our, this leads right into my next question. So, (laughs) um, on purpose, our organization justice in the classroom has implemented tons of programs on our Instagram, just trying Mm to, um, to start these conversations about remote learning and what it's going to be like. We have our social media series called remote relief, which is trying to uh, have like videos and just sit down how to teach teaching people how to use software like zoom or Google hangouts for the classroom. So on that same note, um, Justice in the Classroom has six proposals dedicated to equity and inclusion Mm -hmm. in Ventura County and just school districts. So we want to know which one of these proposals you feel uh, most strongly about or think can be implemented throughout your uh, area. Okay, I had it up and now it's shut down. So I'm trying to like remember where it went. (laughs) But if I remember correctly, it was mainly the equity piece that making sure that people all students, but especially my two, two ones are like the, you know, the alphabet, I guess, um, BIPOC, or, and then for me too, is the LGBTQTIA, (laughs) we go with both those, is that making sure that we are being culturally responsive, that we are being inclusive, that we are looking at these systemic issues, the systemic racism that literally puts barriers in front of students that makes it so difficult that they can't even get through the application process or even um, registering for classes sometimes because they don't have the supports that others do. It, for me, it's gonna always come back to that access part and having those conversations, looking at it going, okay, it's not fair. And, it, and if we say, oh, it is, everybody, it's always, everybody's getting the same. It's not, it's not the same. I'm sorry, you can give us all the same, but some people are gonna need more at different times and some people are always gonna need more. And how are we responding to that? So I know privilege, woman of privilege, but I have um, several disabilities. So as a person with a disability, when I was in college, I, for the first time in my life, started to advocate for myself and saying, listen, I can't do this type of learning in this way. And it was amazing. It was so empowering. It was the first time I learned when I was 18 or the last week of my senior year of high school that I have attention deficit with hyperactivity disorder. Now, don't tell me if you could tell or not. I don't care. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I, ha- I found it. So I went through all this schooling thinking I was dumb. And it turned out I wasn't. It turned out that I had a barrier and the way schooling was set up back then was it was just impossible for girls, especially because there weren't studies on how ADHD affected women because they thought it was only male. And so then I had all these barriers to break through despite sitting on a mountain of privilege. Right. And to think that there are my students and my former students and people that have maybe a disability definitely have um, one of our areas that that has been proven to show that they are systemically disadvantaged and have that compound. I only know what it felt like not to be able to access learning on a very entry level, if you will, and it was debilitating. And when I finally was able to advocate for myself and have people that heard and supported me, it was like gangbusters. I was off. It was, I was ready. School became fun again. Education became a tool for enlightenment and power and, and success instead of this, uh, anchor, um, pulling me down, making me feel like I'm not going to succeed. It was now this like bolstering me and just pushing me forward. And I, it is my hope and my prayer, my desire that what I do as a teacher and then in the future, God willing, uh, what I do on the board gives that empowerment by giving that access, by giving students with disabilities, students of color, students of um, challenges across the board, a sense of they are worthy, they are valued, and damn it, they deserve access to education. And they, we need to, as leaders, take those barriers down so that everyone has access. That was mine of your, of the six that you had in there, there was so many that I agreed with and so many that I, well, all of them I agreed with, but so many that I loved and it really 
really excited me to see that so many young leaders and are collaborating together because it's just going to make such a transformation in our community and i'm so happy to even have this conversation with you we're Thank so honored you. to have so you fun. here um that's all for our questioning today okay. but um we just want to say that justice in the classroom which is wishes you the best of luck in your thank campaign. you and thank you